Good evening, I'm Chandan Gowda, faculty member at Azim Premji University. I'd like to welcome you to the sixth Azim Premji University public lecture. In keeping with the conviction that knowledge is well served by commitments towards the advancement of social justice, this public lecture series invites individuals committed to rethinking democratic possibilities in India and elsewhere. We expect these lectures to contribute to furthering critical conversations in the public. We are delighted that Pratap Banu Mehta, a foremost social scientist and political commentator in the country, is delivering the lecture this evening. Pratap Mehta is presently director of the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi. He is also a member of the National Security Advisory Board, Government of India. He has written a book titled The Burden of Democracy. He has co-edited two books, The Oxford Companion to Politics in India and Public Institutions in India. His present research interests include the institution of Indian judiciary and more broadly constitutionalism in the country, Pratap Mehta's newspaper writings which are anchored in rigorous social science and liberal normative commitments have been justly influential. His newspaper columns are an archive of exemplary intellectual responses to the variety of institutional challenges confronting our fast transforming society. Pratap Bhanumeda's lecture this evening is entitled Rule of Law in a Developing Society. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chandan, for that generous introduction. I'd also like to uh, congratulate uh, Azim Premji uh, University. Uh, I think um, the flowering of new experiments in higher education is the thing this country needs most urgently. And I think this institution is going to be one of um, shining uh, exemplars in that tradition. Um, so sort of my best wishes. Um, and it's a really re real privilege to be here. Um, it is a bit intimidating uh, and frankly a bit difficult uh, speaking to this audience uh, for three reasons. The first reason is that, you know, whenever I've been to Bangalore, um, my friend Ram Guha always sort of ends a conversation with an admonition, what do you people from Delhi know? Um, and in fact, my message today is going to be what do people in Delhi actually know? Although I do end up protesting that I'm not really from Delhi, still don't live in Delhi, so don't hold it against me. But I think, I think it's not a trivial issue in terms of what we are going to talk about. Um, I think the second reason it's a bit tough in a sense is I'm trying to do two things in this paper. One is in a sense addressed to uh, my academic colleagues who write on law. Uh, and uh, perhaps it's a kind of, I'd like to think of it as a common sense intervention in an academic discourse on law. So those who are not in that legal field will, will, will probably stand up and say what Sherlock Holmes said to Dr. Watson, your grasp of the obvious amazes me. But sometimes in academics, that's, that's worth, worth, worth doing. Um, on the other hand, there is some, hopefully, a little bit of technical stuff, which I, which I hope won't, 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 won't bore you uh, too much. And the final sort of just preliminary challenge before I get to the substance is, um, what I'm going to focus on is, in some senses, uh, try to take a kind of big picture view of the challenges facing how we think about the institution of law. And to make the discussion simple at this moment, I'll use the term law usely, loosely to encompass law making, I mean, actually the you know, enactment of legislation and what we call law. Uh, but also the practice of courts and judiciaries, uh, although a lot of what I have to say really is about um, those, those practices. It's a little bit of a reckless talk because it tries to traverse, you know, pretty large themes and uh, runs the risk of kind of, you know, mm, being superficial to lawyers, to political scientists. And, and my only defense is I hope the political science people will find the law interesting enough and the lawyers will find the political science interesting enough. So what am I going to talk about? Um, what I want to talk about is in a sense, I think, situate law, um, I think in two sets of questions. Um, the question of the relationship between law and development is often posed. Um, uh, the, the way it's usually posed um, is, takes one or two of the following forms. 
either it's posed as a very instrumental empirical question, right? So does the rule of law produce economic growth or not, right? Does, is the rule of law good for business, right? I mean, there's a huge literature on that. Um, and that literature is, is interesting, although empirically very indeterminate, uh, in, surprisingly indeterminate, actually, uh, despite uh, uh, appearances uh, 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 to, the, uh, you know, to the contrary. Uh, the second kind of question is, in a sense, sort of almost the reverse, which is, how do broad developments in society change our conceptions of law and our capacities to, as it were, navigate law? So this is the kind of thing we were discussing this morning in a conference in Ajim Premji University where you say, look, as education levels rise, as people's consciousness rises, you will find different kinds of pressures being exerted on the judicial system, perhaps in the form of more litigation or something, right? My questions are not, I mean, what I have to say will touch upon these, but only, only peripherally. What I'm going to sort of try and ask rather differently is what is the special challenge that law faces in establishing its authority right, in a developing society like India's, and particularly at the historical juncture that we are at? And what might have to change both about the law, the way it conceives of itself, or rather way, the way those who practice law, judiciary, courts, legislators conceive of, of law, what might have to change about that for it to be able to respond to the historical juncture that we are at? Also, conversely, what might have to change about us, the way we think about law's authority? Uh, and where shall this, um, this, this twain meet? Now, the authority of law at one level, you might say, is a very experiential thing. Uh, it's a question of the experience of the mundane practices of courts. And our record in that sphere is, to put it politely, very mixed. Uh, justice the justice delivery system is horrendously broken. Um, I think most of us appreciate Arundhati Roy's uh, one genuinely profound remark. In India, you don't get punishment after the due process. Due process is the punishment, right? Uh, or perhaps more metaphysically, you know, Kafka's view of the law, that one thing the law does is it makes the line between the elect and the damned very hard to identify indeed, is I think an experience most ordinary citizens do have when they come up in the grip of the law. Law is meant to liberate us from fear. That's its primary function, as Hobbes said, right? Somebody's taking care of uh, security and so forth. But it has to be said in India, law produces its own fear, right? And so to quote Macbeth, uh, or, or a line from Macbeth, I think our, in, in a very experiential day-to-day -day sense, our experience of law is this even-handed justice commits the ingredients of our own poison chalice to our own lips. I mean, there's a very sort of schizophrenic kind of view of law. Yeah. Now, there is part answer to solving this problem, and, and, and that's the kind of answer that, for example, we were discussing today all day in this conference at the Jean Premji University. That's the discourse that a lot of people are engaged in in Delhi, which is really about correcting the supply side of the justice system. So, you know, have more judges, have better trained judges, better procedural systems, better court management, you know, better use of IT, uh, better use of technology, all, all kinds of supply side solutions to making the experience of engaging with the legal system. Uh, perhaps a little less onerous and a little less um, uh, 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 unpleasant. And certainly there's a lot to be done on that front. Uh, but that's not, in a sense, what I'm going to uh, focus on um, here uh, a, 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 as well. Um, so apart from the in daily institutional experience of law, the second kind of big challenge to law's authority in any system, this is not particular to developing countries, really depends on law's perceived independence, right? So if somebody told you, and as I think most of us in, in very many moments of our lives believe, that the process of law itself is manipulated, it itself is hostage to vested interest, that its neutrality is a kind of facade, right, to serve particular sectional interests, the authority of law in some senses diminishes, right? Now, for this is one of the reasons why, of course, judicial independence, right, and it's not independence just from the political executive. It's independence from all influences that are supposedly extraneous to the practice of law itself is a very important ingredient 
right? In, as it were, the authority of law. But, the, but this is very nice in theory, in some senses, right? Judicial independence is an important value. But in actual practice, in any society, Independence is not a property that inheres in a system. It's a property that has to be created through daily negotiation and the daily practices of adjudication. And the record of the Indian judiciary, in some senses, is again there interestingly mixed. Um, and, and I do want to sort of flag this point um, uh, 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 for a couple of minutes. Because any judiciary faces this big challenge in terms of establishing its authority if it challenges the power structure or the existing political settlement too radically, then the likelihood of its being overturned right, by extra constitutional means or some other means is actually pretty high. Right? Um, in that sense, any institution, when it's trying to establish its authority, is also trying to judge right, what is it that will allow it to continue with that authority, right? So in some countries, when courts dismiss governments, governments basically dismiss courts, right? Or the army takes over or something happens, right? In India's case, except sort of with the marginal exception of the emergency, that has actually not happened. But I think it is worth thinking about why that has not happened. Uh, it has not happened in part, and, and, and I'll put this out as a provocation, because we think of the Indian judiciary as incredibly independent, which it is in, in some respects. But it is because it has never, ever seriously established, challenged anything about the existing power structure, right? And you can come at it at very many different angles. So for example, on political cases, right, whether from Ram Janbhumi onwards to, I don't know, 69% reservation, right? I mean, something that would really polarize politics in some ways, right? It has adopted an avoidance strategy. On social and economic rights, as Madhav Khosla has kind of reminded us, it has made incredibly high-sounding pronouncements, right? Right to this, right to that. But its remedies are actually very, very, in some senses, meager. Uh, it has taken on politicians, but actually its track record of really going after them in a sustained way, you could argue, I think the 2G judgment was in some senses a, a manifestation of that, is actually pretty, pretty measured, right? So in that sense, it has in part sustained its authority by being a political institution, not in a politically partisan sense, that it's Congress or BJP, but a political institution in the sense that very mindful of the fact that it does not want the larger political culture, right, or, or the political settlement to, as it were, uh, um, engage in a backlash uh, against its authority. Now, we can debate whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I would argue, I think, if looking, looking at the history of Indian jurisprudence, that in that sense, what the court has done, when we think of judicial review in India, uh, it's not so much a kind of first principles defense of judicial review, as has happened in, I think, most jurisdictions, at least the way we think about it, it is rather the court has placed itself in the position of conflict management, right? Uh, it's not placed itself in a position of first principles adjudication. And it's a feature of con conflict management that you're trying to second guess what you can get away with without upsetting the apple cart too much. And I think this gives Indian law, or at least Indian constitutional law, a peculiarity, I think, I think most of us who read Indian constitutional law judgments uh, sort of often tear our hair out. Um, not because sometimes they're too long, they're sort of, you know. But you, you don't find, as it were, the kind of neat consistency of principle that you would expect. And I have, over time, come to believe that not only is this deliberate, right, but this is an essential manifestation of the way in which the judiciary, as it were, uh, it continues itself. So the point of the judiciary is to find a formula where contradictory demands can be reconciled without, without decisively settling the actual point of controversy. Right? Uh, so it's a kind of search for a dilatory formula instead of a resolution. And it's been enormously successful in creating its authority this way because the one thing it has able to do 
is to give everybody a reason to keep this game going on, right? Uh, so I think when we when we judge the court, we have to sort of judge it, ju you know, judge it in 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 these uh, in these uh, dimensions, right? But one of the things that has happened over the last few years, as many people have noted, is that in this function of co conflict management, formally at least the judiciary has expanded the scope of its functions considerably. We don't think of it simply as a court, right? We think of it as an institution of governance, literally speaking, right? And that's the part I want to sort of, in a sense, focus on in, 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 in the remaining, uh, remaining part um, of this lecture. I should also say one thing as an aside. I mean, just, this is just a kind of little parenthetical remark. That what little empirical evidence we have on the Indian judiciary does bring out one rather remarkable fact that, you know, at the edges you can complain about it. But by and large, it's empirically very hard to make the case that considerations of identity or ethnicity can easily explain what the judiciary does. Uh, in fact, if you examine large numbers of cases, right, let's say involving minorities and so forth, it is actually remarkable if you, if, if you do a sort of large, large scale uh, data analysis that by and large the Indian judiciary comes across as relatively impartial, at least on those dimensions, right? Um, uh, okay. so, so what are the challenges facing the judiciary as a governance institution at, uh, at this point? And, 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 and to grasp at this point, I, I will sort of talk about a couple of interesting historical conjunctures India is at. Now, when we think of law and development, as I said, the canonical model of thinking about development is development measured by a certain, certain set of yardsticks, right? So we say developing countries are typically poor, per capita income is low, you know, human development index is low and so forth. I want to characterize the problem of development slightly differently. Um, and the first element of what makes a developing society, right? And I think this is particularly true of India at this juncture, but it's true of South, South Africa, it's true of Brazil, is what you might call the simultaneity of historical time, right? Which is that there are lots of different modes of production, if you want to think in classes Marxist terms, or if you want to think in sort of more conventional common sense terms, lots of different modes of relating to economic well-being that exist simultaneously in the same space. So to simplify and put it very crudely, India as a society, as we often say, it has everything from feudalism to postmodernism, right? But the important point about Right? These characterizations of social epochs, and, you know, in, in, in transitions we often say people have moved from feudalism to capitalism to something else, post-industrial society, right? Is that all of those aspects are concrete social realities, right? And I think this is an important point to actually recognize um, uh, in the Indian context. They all have a social base, right? So you still have Khampachayats who have a genuine social base. I mean, it's not, it's not just simply... A, a nutty idea, right? right? You have people who are literally in bonded labor or experiencing simply first generation liberation from bonded labor. And you have people who are thinking, I don't know what, McKinsey, Wall Street, something, right? Another form of bonded labor, but anyway, right? <laughs> uh, now the challenge this poses, and I think, I think we don't often appreciate the, the, the significance of this is that what it does to the citizenry, first of all, is that it makes their experience of law and policy very variegated. The old truism that where you stand will determine, in a sense, what you think of law and policy, you know, how you think of it very differently. But it also gives people very different historical imaginations, right? Very different sense of trust in different trajectories that are possible, right? right? Now, think of this fact very seriously and ask this question. What does it mean to negotiate a consensus in a society like this? Right? And this is not a question just, just the courts face. I mean, I, one of the big challenges when I moved back from the US to teaching in a classroom in an Indian university was, 
you actually saw that visibly there. I mean, in the US, you could take it for granted. Most kids are either middle class or up. They have a sort of basically background consensus, right? Uh, relatively recognizable set of social experiences despite you know, uh, attempts at affirmative action. Uh, but what do you do in a classroom, right? Where your sense of these economic trajectories and possibilities is very different. What would it mean to negotiate a legal and moral consensus in such an environment? And I think part of the challenges that actually the courts are facing is, is that I don't think the form of social evolution we have at the moment permits that easy consensus. So what it gives rise to, and this is the second feature of development I want to talk about, so there's this kind of simultaneity of historical time, is what you might call the persistence of wicked problems. Now, wicked problems is a very technical term in policy literature. It comes from a paper from Weber and Rittel who kind of first identified what a wicked problem is. Uh, but I think in all our policy discussions in contemporary India, we haven't paid due acknowledgement to what a wicked problem is. So wicked problem has the following features. I'll just define what a wicked problem is, then give a couple of examples, and then how it relates to the law. It's a problem that's unique in nature, right? It can't be easily assimilated to some other kind of problem. There is even a lack of definitive formulation of such a problem. You know there is a problem, but you can't quite define it very clearly. And I'll give examples of what I mean by that. There is the existence of multiple explanations for why we have that problem, right? There is the absence of a clear test to decide the value of any response to that problem. So you aren't quite sure what will solve it and when do you know that you have solved it, right? And finally and most importantly, each response that you make to that problem has consequences but there is no opportunity to learn from that consequences and correct course. Okay, that's what makes the problem wicked. Okay? Now think of the characteristic problems that not just our policymakers, but in a sense law has to face. Think of urbanization. Right? Urbanization classically is considered the prime paradigm case of a wicked problem. What is actually the problem? I mean, we have some vague sense, you know, you want to move people off agriculture into something called dense agglomerations called cities. What are these things called cities, right? I mean, is Delhi a city or is it a collection of 25 different cities that just has a municipal boundary name, right? Um, what are the multiple trajectories, explanations for what actually, in a sense, generates um, cities? But the most important thing about urban development, as we know, is its immense path dependence. You can make a massive intervention now, but your sunk costs and your ability to move it to a different direction will be very limited. And, and that's the point about social learning. And in fact, if you look, of, look at large architecture schemes across the world, right, whether it's urbanization, whether it's healthcare systems, whether it's education systems, what is quite astonishing is the incredible path dependence of those schemes. I mean, the United States has taken 50 years to actually move the original architecture of its healthcare system to something else. Britain can't quite move it, right? Um, right? Now, one of the characteristics of a developing country is that most of our policy challenges fall in this sort of broad domain of wicked problems. So take something that you know, people often talk about a lot. It's, it's, it's something my colleagues at CPR work on a lot, you know, existence of slums, right? Now, I was completely blown away a couple of years ago reading an article by uh, one of China's leading economic historians um, and, and, and contemporary political theorists, uh, Qin Hui, who basically wrote this piece in China saying that there should be a right to a slum. Okay? Now, in the Chinese context, he has a specific moral claim. The moral claim is roughly that the state should not control migration. Right? That's one thing we sort of got right, although in some senses, I think the contrast between India and China can be overstated. Delhi's evicted half a million people in the last four or five years. So if somebody tells you we can't do China, that simply, it simply is not true at one level, right? Okay. But, so, so you had a moral point, but there was an underlying economic point to 
And the economic point brings out the characteristic of the wicked problem. And my colleague Partho Mukhopadhyay has, I think, sort of articulated it quite well. The problem is the following. What is a slum? Right? Now, at one level, we worry about slums because of the conditions of the people who live in it. You, you know, we think surely there are ways of improving it and, and sort of you know, uh, make those conditions less appalling. From an economics point of view, a slum is a low-cost entry point into the city. Right? Okay. And it's low cost precisely because it is appalling. Okay? Most Indian slums are beehives of economic activity. And of course, the Haravi is, of course, famously known for sort of, you know, how, uh, uh, in a sense, what an economically dynamic place it is, right? But essentially, it's a low point entry barrier in the sense, I mean, just theoretically, although now these days some slums can also be quite expensive to enter into. You need connections and networks. But it's a low point entry barrier precisely for those reasons, right? There are few civic services, you come, you show up, hopefully you find a footpath initially to begin with, you set up a shop that's partly illegal, God knows what its legal status is. Now think of the dilemma. What happens if you for actually formalized all these spaces? The challenge Chin Hui put out is that essentially you will raise the costs of entries to cities, right? Uh, if you remove hawkers or raise licensing fees for hawkers in cities, you raise the entry barriers into cities. And, and the amazing thing is places like Gurgaon, you can actually see that in happen. I mean, you know, to, set, to just stand under a tree and iron clothes, you have to pay 15,000 rupees to the state now a month. Right? Now, it's a wicked problem in the sense that it's very hard to know how to get this right. Right? If you make entry into the cities too comfortable and too cheap prematurely, you may actually accelerate premature migration. Right? Suppose your argument said, everybody who comes from the city gets a house. What do you think is going to happen? Right? On the other hand, right, if you raise the costs of entry, right, you actually slow down in a sense the right kind of migration. Now the interesting thing is there's almost no developing country city that we can think of that got this quite right, right? And it's actually very hard to, any, any, as it were, reverse decisions that were made at one point. Now, wh how is this, in a sense, relevant to, to law? And so think of, for example, the contemporary debate over the Land Acquisition Act, right? Some would argue the single most consequential act we are probably going to, you know, discuss in parliament, right? My worry about the debate over the Land Acquisition Act is that I think there's, I think different sides have a lot of certainty about their position, right? So what would be the effect if you did not allow the state to acquire land for private parties? Do we know what that effect is going to be? Industry says it's going to make land acquisition very difficult, right? NGOs say it's actually going to make land acquisition easy because it's going to expose people to land sharks, right? Or worse, what it's going to do is it's going to increase the incentive to resort to extra ju ju judicial means of capturing land, right? Okay. Uh, what is it going to do to spatial formation in India, right? Is it going to be the case that if you leave it to largely to private transactions, what you will get is, in a sense, a lot of fragmented land transactions, as opposed to optimal agglomerations that you need? Right? Now, the honest truth is, in the empirical literature, it's very, very hard to find answers to these questions. But it's hard to find answers to these questions for the particular reason that this is a wicked problem. Namely, that the answers are always endogenous to the workings of the system. We don't know what would happen until at least 10 to 15 years in the game, by which time you've created enough vested interest for that particular system to be able to move it, right? You know, I don't know. If you let private industry say, say to private industry, please acquire land on your own, you know, maybe they'll be smart enough. Maybe they will evolve cultures of negotiation with affected parties, the way they invested a lot of capital into creating cultures of negotiation so that they could manipulate the state. Maybe that could happen, right? 
But the point in, in some senses is, so, so when we are thinking about law and the authority of law, what is good law, right? How are we going to adjudicate questions of this kind? As a society, as a legislature, and I think, I, I mean, I think in some senses the, the real conflict on the land acquisition bill is, at one level it is a good faith conflict. I mean, you know, you can always say industry has its interest and NGOs have their own lobbies and, you know, some people want to use this to stop industrialization. But if you are intellectually honest, you could see each of those equilibria as a real possibility. And there is no way at this point you can actually adjudicate this. So now what is a judge supposed to do, right? And this is going to come up for adjudication, right? Now, one thing that has, I think, changed, and, and, and so this is the third aspect of the particular, the, this moment I want to talk about, and then I'll sort of wrap up with possible solutions to this, is if you look at, looked at the prior Land Acquisition Act, and by the way, this is true of a whole range of things. I mean, Narega, for example, right? If you think of it as a legal intervention of a certain kind, I think 10 years from now, my guess is that when we write the history of Narega, we will find that its greatest effect was an externality nobody anticipated in designing the scheme, namely the empowerment of women. I think the evidence on whether it gives, increases wage rates is, mixed. I think the linkage of Narega with inflation, frankly, I think the, you know, again, we won't know. The one thing we do ambiguously know, unambiguously know, is majority of the participants in Narega are women. What does that mean for a very different kind of, you know, social transformation? So it is in the nature of these big legal interventions that we are making. RT is the same thing, right? If you honestly ask me today, is there any social science that can tell me which way RTE will pan out? I don't know. Right? So in some ways, I think our biggest problem as a society, and, and my worry, I think, about our public debates is there are too many people with certainties, too few genuine doubting Thomases. You know? But that is the nature of that, is what are courts going to do in this kind of context of adjudication? Right? Up till now, what court, courts have done in economic legis legislation has actually, by and large, been actually a, an act of abdication. I mean, if you look at the origins of the land acquisition controversy, you know, at one level, you could have actually thought of the old la land acquisition bill working fairly well. It has a provision, it should be for public purpose, and it has mechanism for compensation. It all turns on how you define these two things. Essentially, what the courts did, by and large, was defer to the executive on that. So if you say private development for jobs is public purpose, fine, we'll go along with you, right? That's the source of that trust deficit that led to the creation of this new act or a demand for a new act, right? But the challenge that this poses, I think for the judiciary and, 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 and rulemaking and law is the following, right? Uh, the, the first principal challenge it poses is, I think judiciaries and legislators are by and large used to thinking of the rule of law as being equivalent to the law of rules, right? Which is, there is a temptation in these large architectures to create nationally homogeneous rules, right? Partly you want these rules because you distrust discretion. So even in the Land Acquisition Act, right, the idea of, let's say, creating a land acquisition authority that could, you know, fine-tune what public purpose means, that could, you know, really invest in, we don't want that. Why do we don't want that? Because we don't trust the state, right? right? But across our legislation, there's going to be an increasing conflation, as I said, of the rule of law with the law of rules. And the law of rules is exactly what we don't need in a rigid way when you are faced with wicked problems, right? Okay. So the question is, can the judiciary shape its interpretive practices to respond to this new policy challenge that it's going to do? The other, the third and the final big change, so sort of there's the simultaneity of development experiences, there's the wicked problems story, 
The third feature, I think, of our contemporary moment, which is going to pose a challenge for all of government, and which is what we are living through right now, and this, I think, is an optimistic story, is I actually believe we are undergoing a governance revolution. Okay? I'm not as pessimistic about all these sort of dark stories of governance tales that we are talking about. Why? Fundamentally, the old the state, I'm just calling it the old ancient regime, right? This is a shorthand, was founded on four principles, which are basically collapsing. First principle was vertical accountability. You are accountable only to people above you, right? Secretary accountable to minister, minister accountable to prime minister. In some vague sense, all of them accountable to the people at some point every five years but the actual operations of accountability were largely vertical. Second was secrecy, right? State had incredibly more information than you did. Not just about particular cases, they could keep files secret and so forth, but just, you know, measuring outcomes, whatever, right? The third was the state had wide discretion, right? And the fourth, which I won't talk about, but broadly the state was centralized. Now, part of what's happening is this moment and why you are seeing such a lot of poison coming out is all of these principles have collapsed. The agents of horizontal accountability have increased their power, not just within government, you know, courts, CNG, various CAG, various other agencies, media and so forth, right? But I think citizens are beginning to smell this opportunity for horizontal accountability, which is why I think the Lokpal base is slightly odd because I think its model is very much a vertical model rather than a horizontal service delivery model. Information, not just because of the Right to Information Act, which has in a sense, I think, has changed equations between state and civil society, but civil society's ability to mobilize information is now vastly different than 20 years ago. If state doesn't want to monitor pollution in Bangalore, you know, some NGO will come and do it for you and go to the state and say, you're poisoning us, right? I mean, this is a revolution in the making, actually, really quite a radical one. And the third on discretion, uh, I think something interesting is going on which is related to law, which is that by and large in the old system, discretion meant that by definition, you don't have to justify discretion to anybody other than your superiors, right? Now, that has cumulatively created a trust deficit in the system where we don't want the state to exercise any discretion at all. In fact, I think part of the problem with contemporary legislation and lawmaking is that it's an overreaction to discretion. I mean, there's this assumption that you can have a rule. If you give the state official any discretion, something wrong will happen. And I think it has huge perverse consequences, right? But one of the things I think that we are looking for is that, okay, exercise discretion, but explain publicly in ways that are convincing why a particular choice was made when that discretionary power was exercised, right? One thing common to all the scams that are coming out is that at one level in the practice of the state, they violated one or two or three of these principles. The first thing that strikes you about the others file, if you see it is, it's written by people who never thought anybody would see this thing, right? Now, the revolution we are at this moment is, I think these principles have collapsed forever. Any governance system that's premised on restoring any of these principles is doomed to failure. Now, what's happening at this political moment is, I think, because that old regime is collapsing, there's a kind of defensiveness in it. You don't know who's going to get caught. You don't know what more poison is going to come out, right? So it's reacting in a way which is not riding this wave fully. It's not saying, how do we make this governance transition to respond to this new and fundamental reality that we are going to face in governance? Right? It's basically trying to defend itself in all kinds of strange ways by denying that the problem exists and so forth. Right? So my submission, and, and, and that's why I actually do think, I mean, I think for the next couple of years you'll see a lot more poison coming out. I mean, we haven't seen the tip of the iceberg yet. But that churning is the good thing. I think the issue is not the poison. I think the issue is how we respond to it. But for courts, this poses a particular challenge because by and large courts, I think 
are used to thinking of themselves in the old framework. Vertical accountability. So the only internal mechanisms of accountability in the court are vertical. If the Supreme Court can exercise some discipline over high courts, which it can't increasingly, right? Uh, the court's way of justifying what it does is basically by reference to a rule. So lawyers and judges traditionally interpret rules, right? The challenge is that when it comes to rules applicable to wicked problems, your traditional legal methods of interpreting those rules right, can mislead you incredibly or, 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 or in a sense give you a non-solution. right? Because what you want from the court, if it is becoming an institution of governance, is the best it can do an all things considered analysis. right? of what that rules requires in this particular situation. Now the trouble is that the courts are not equipped to do that. They're not equipped to do that by virtue of the training of judges. They're not equipped to do that by virtue of what lawyers present before them. I mean, a lot depends on, in a sense, you know, what arguments the lawyers actually present in court. Whether it's the food security case, whether it's the right to education case, I'm sure you'll have land acquisition case. I mean, all across the board, right? So what the courts, and, and traditional juristic methods of justifying decisions is basically by authority to a rule, right? That's why we say it's the rule of law, not the rule of men, right? But you will have to move to a regime of actual judgment rather than the application of uh, uh, actually a rule in which the court is, as it were, simply one forum in a network of institutions that allows for this very fractious public deliberation to actually go on. So my, in a sense, I think submission to you, and, and this is a challenge for governance in general, not just, uh, uh, in a sense, not, not just for courts, is will we be able to move to a conception of law, right, that is not rule-bound in the traditional sense, which carries authority not by virtue of its being a simple statute, parliament enacted it, I mean, that's one source of its authority, right? But because it encapsulates, right, and all things considered judgment about how to address a wicked problem in, in, in some sense. Now, it's easier said than done to say all things, what is an all things considered judgment, right? One of the big failures of government in recent times and why it's in so much political trouble is that it cannot justify any of the decisions it took, right? Because the practice of that justification now requires speaking to citizens, but speaking to citizens at the level and position at which they are, right? I mean, you're not going to convince protesters in Kodakulam if your nuclear safety report is secret, right? I mean, it will require a very different practice of justification. And my own sense is that I think our politics and our policy making structures are unnecessarily polarized, in part because we are not asking this question, what does it mean to offer justification to fellow citizens, right? And that's where we come in, which is when we deliberate with our fellow citizens, what's the point of that deliberation? Is the point of that deliberation, you can think of it as an adversarial contest, right? I'm a socialist, you're a capitalist, let's see who wins out. I like industrialization, you don't like industrialization, let's see who wins out, right? The problem with that mode is that that mode is going to not only inherently generate conflict, but it is going to inherently undermine the authority of law because at some point people are going to say, well, why is this law for me? What it will require instead, right, is when you go into politics, or the practices of politics, is how do I reason in ways in which the purpose of that reasoning is to arrive at mutually acceptable agreements, right? I think land acquisition bill is going to be, a, in a sense, a classic, in a sense, instance of this, right? An instance of this at all levels, 
both in the architecture of what actually happens in parliament, right? How do you create a framework of justification which convinces industry? You know, if you do certain things right, this building will not harm you. And convinces the guy whose land is going to be, you know, is vulnerable or who feels potentially vulnerable, that this piece of legislation is actually going to protect you. Now, the challenge, as I said, is this circle is not going to be squared by your traditional ways of rulemaking. It requires a very different conception of political justification. Right? And in that sense, in that sense, right, I think the future of rule of law depends not on what courts do, not on what judges do, not on what legislators do, but whether the practices of our democracy change radically enough to move from an adversarial system to a much more deliberative one. And the authority of law in that sense will depend paradoxically on its becoming more demo democratic rather than standing above law and promulgating from on high. I'll stop there. It's time for some questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> very interesting talk. And you did a bit of plain talking, which is essential uh, right now in the country. One point uh, which um, I'm concerned is the accountability which you talked about. Now you said we have some accountability, but it is vertical. But really, if you look at it, do we have an accountability at all? Now you say, what is the maximum? You have the top, the prime minister, and you can go up to that. Then who is going to be accountable to the people? Now, prime minister is elected, of course, this prime minister is but then, but then um, some, the, some ministers are elected and uh, the people, the bureaucrats and the people at the district level, state level, uh, they are accountable to the ministers and the prime minister. And uh, when it reaches there, the prime minister says, or the minister says, I'm not aware. He talks to the bureaucrat. He said, so what they say is wrong and this is right. And they say that nothing can be done. Then what happens? People go to the judiciary. I mean, I'm talking about the Supreme Court. And then Supreme Court, what happened? You mentioned about the rule of law. The political system today is uh, traumatizing the judiciary with all kinds of unwanted things. The, what they are supposed to do is going to the court and asking for, can I do it? Or what I did is right. And you tell us what was wrong with it. Now, this is not the job of the court. So therefore, what I wanted to ask you is, the, really, do we have an accountability? One. Now, who is responsible, accountable to the people? Now, see, why I mentioned this is, in some small countries, you know, I'll just, I'll just mention, because small, there was an experiment of bringing the CEO system into the government, that if a person is appointed at a, on a, uh, on a position, he said, uh, you know, the tasks are defined, and he said three years' time, and then there is an accountability test. And if it is not, uh, you know, accomplished, he has to answer. Otherwise, remove him from there, throw him out. This happened in one or two countries, it is done, but I don't think it will happen in India. But the point is, uh, I want your view on this. Can we have a governance without accountability? And accountability means, the horizontal and the, the top down to the people. That's all I want. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Sorry for the long question. I think it's an observation. Uh, the challenges posed by democratization, by democratization I mean in our Indian specific case, say the assertion of the middle caste groups, like assertion of Dravidian politics or assertion of the middle caste in UP, Dalits in UP, or even assertion of a sort of populist assertion like Mamata in West Bengal. Uh, these are definitely putting pressures on the national governance system. Though, it was more in the states, but gradually it's putting greater and greater pressure on the national government system. But you see the judiciary relatively uninfluenced by these sort of forces of democratization. To some extent that helped judiciary to continue in a sort of a modern elite of the post-independent era, even today. But, and that also saved us to some extent. I, mean, I would say, you know, it's beneficial and at the same time it has some cost. But the benefits of judiciary are primarily driven by this relative uninfluence of the process of democratization. That means now we are really facing a much more serious problem in future. So possibly the design of judiciary in India at that point of time enabled this, uh, what, what I would call relative independence from the forces of democratization. And how, how is that going to change and how is that going to pose a challenge for the judiciary as well as for the governance as a whole. Uh, I'll keep my question very specific. Uh, in the context of what you spoke about the uh, four uh, paradigms of, uh, of the, the old paradigm of the governance state breaking down, right? I have two questions for you. Firstly, do you think that the increasing, I think that the breakdown of the paradigms of secrecy and vertical accountability in the state is being countered by the increasing exercise of police power? by the state in recent times, when you look at it, anti-terror legislations, increased cyber monitoring, so on and so forth. Secondly, when you spoke about the lack, of, about how the judiciary is not equipped to deal with this change, because it itself follows a system of vertical accountability, uh, I think, as, as in, I, first I want to ask you, what is the alternative? Like, is a horizontal model yeah. feasible, given the need, as in the importance of judicial independence, which at present is only feasible within a model of vertical accountability? How do you explain um, the lack of um, enforcement of a law where there is no um, judgment involved, judgment, value judgment involved? Let's say traffic rules, um, both not only from the state, but even from uh, citizens. What is the kind of deliberation that goes on there? I mean, what, and if you compare it to, compare it across societies, um, some societies have a higher level of you know, rule following, mm -hmm. and some don't, and we are a society that doesn't follow that kind of rules. So how do we explain that when there is no value judgment involved? Yeah, I think there's big questions, maybe one more, and then. Yeah, uh, uh, good evening, sir, and oh, yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Uh, very insightful speech. Uh, I'm just gonna stick to uh, um, two very specific questions. Uh, uh, in the light of you defining wicked problems and uh, wicked problems being the major bone of contention as it were in most of our policy deliberations, uh, my, and you further went on to uh, theorize a sort of deliberative process in uh, like uh, judicial uh, structures. So uh, in approaching these deliberative processes of law and issues of development, how do we factor in trade-offs that are inherent in unique problems, I mean uh, wicked problems, uh, in the all things considered uh, approach of adjudication? And further, how do we generate an equilibrium in the judicial process and legal structures of individual rights juxtaposed with commons in uh, an all things considered sort of framework? <laughs> wow, that's, a, that's quite a menu. Um, I'll begin with a couple of the kind of easy questions and then sort of knit together the larger questions about sort of, you know, what's the alternative. Um, um, first, I think the question about federalism that I think you asked. Uh, uh, I think there are two dimensions to it which I think need to be separated out. Uh, one, I think, is actually a positive development. One. I think is a contingent development. We don't know how it's going to work out. 
the positive development is the fact that, uh, in my view, uh, I think the Indian state is too centralized. Uh, I think this political backlash against centralization was inevitable uh, and necessary. Um, as in politics, it's finding a moment and pretext to express itself. I'm not so much worried about that backlash against centralization. I think, I think the interesting thing is how do we respond to it, right? Uh, 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 I mean, will we sort of respond in old imperious ways or really do now say that if you do things like the NCDC, you better first consult 20 chief ministers, right? That's a, so in a structural sense, I see it part of, in a sense, that revolution. I'm not, I mean, and, and you know, again, it'll go through. Percent. The second aspect of it, which I think is disturbing most people in this, at this moment, is the association of that federalism with, for want of a better word, populism. You know, Mamta Banerjee holding up whatever diesel price reform or something, right? That, I think, is a slightly different question from the first one, although in politics, the two, the two play to it. Uh, one, you can look at it as a, as a matter of pure electoral strategy, right? Which is, it's not so much populism, it's more I want to embarrass the government. Because at the moment, frankly, it is the rational strategy for every political party to embarrass the government. Absolutely rational strategy. I mean, the more it looks like Congress can't govern, every other party benefits, right? So, I mean, that, I mean that, that's the kind of simple rational strategy. There's, there's nothing deeply diabolical or populist about it, right? Uh, but there is an ideological element to it. Ideas do matter in politics. And I think the interesting question, and, 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 and you know, this is a kind of insight from, in a sense, you know, old, old sort of Adam Smith, you know, you know, who nobody ever accused him of not being liberal. Uh, often things, uh, I mean, the powerful in society will exercise a disproportionate influence on how society gets shaped. And I think the interesting question is what values, worldviews and ideological configurations does that elite bring to the table, right? Uh, because those horizons actually do matter. And I think the worry people have is in a sense, either this is too populist or not even thought through or ideas, what ideas, right? I think that I think is a, is a, very, is, is a very large cultural question about what is it about those in positions of power and privilege? Even when there are no political obstacles, and that's really the puzzle about, in a sense, the prime minister and, and sort of, right? Uh, why have they talked themselves into a worldview and a causal view of how the world runs that to many people seems deeply counterproductive? I mean, the puzzle about the Congress party at this point is that it actually does have incredible amounts of power. The puzzle is not that it's held hostage to coalition government. The puzzle is it, it's not clear what it believes, right? Does it want an 8% growth, 8% inflation world, a 4% growth, 0% inflation world? I mean, what's the story, right? Tell us that story, right? Uh, and I think, you know, and, and in some senses, uh, it's a question we don't often talk about in political science because it's not fashionable in democracies to talk about it. But how elites come to a sense of social learning and their own sense of their world is, is I think, is, is an important question. And I think the worry about this moment is we've lost the plot there, right? But in part, I think that's also related to the question of public justification. Right? It's related to the question of public justification in the sense of, so I mean, I'll just give a kind of trivial, trivial example not to pick out an individual, but I think it does suggest something. Uh, you can disagree with Jairam Ramesh on everything. The one good thing he does is every order he passes, there's a 40-page explanatory note explaining why he took that decision. Right? Uh, it used to be the old practice of governance in some senses, right? The, the, that question of being able to strategically communicate the reasons, where the reasons are not throwing reasons at people, the reasons talking to people. Okay, this was your concern, here is how we are meet, going to meet it, right? The inability of the political leadership to intellectually do that and not be intellectually equipped to do that, that I think is a worry. I think to me that's a much bigger worry than this kind of federalism, power balance stuff. I think that'll sort of, 
correct itself out. Um, uh, lots of questions about sort of vertical, horizontal, and I, I, I know I was kind of too quick and, 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 and too glib in, 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 in a sense, talking about that. Um, so one, the mundane answer to the institution of the court, right? Uh, I honest, I mean, and, and, and this, is, this is the interesting question between autonomy and in a sense, right? So of course we want judicial independence. Uh, the fact is that the judiciary created its own power vis-a-vis -vis other institutions of government who are, who are actually quite happy to abdicate it to government. Because as I said, at no point did the judiciary actually threaten their power. I mean, that's the beauty of this expansion of judicial review. So politicians are happy. You want to deal with education, go ahead, right? You want to deal with food security, go ahead, right? You know, we'll, we'll figure out a way, right? But its internal control structure is entirely based on, I mean, there isn't even a formal system of vertical accountability. It was premised on informal practices of creating an internal peer culture. Right? What would happen in old days? Chief justices would call up high court judge and say, boss, I think you're getting out of line. You know, Now their ability to do that has, in a sense, diminished. And we can talk about what's happening to the internal court structure, why there is that breakdown of authority internal to courts. Right? But I think the difference, I mean, the, the sense in which I'm talking about horizontal accountability, I think goes more to the structures of justification. Who are you writing a judgment to persuade? Right? And where does that judgment derive its authority from? Right? What is that implied peer group? The standard juristic practice is to write it as if, well, there's law, this is what promulgated as, uh, uh, parliament has promulgated, article two of so-and-so legislation says this, we've interpreted it this way, right? The problem with that way of justifying law and legality is that in some senses it's not doing justice can come from within the domain of law itself or cannot be authoritative only because it refers to some stretched interpretation of article 21 right it has to be persuasive in a very different practice of articulation right the peer group is as i said i have you know, I have, I, I, I have bonded labor in front of me. I have sort of, you know, India's postmodern industrialist front of me. How do I convince as many as possible? And of course, the idea is not that you will have consensus every time. But it requires a very discursive form of reasoning, very different form of reasoning than actually courts are used to, and frankly, than politicians are used to. In fact, that's the politician's job. So it's, it's, it's hard, at least for the courts, it's horizontal in the sense that they have to get away from this idea that law is something that stands above society and politics, and their job is to interpret the law, right? To move from that idea to the idea that the authority of law is part in part constituted by whether it gives reasons to everybody f to go along with that law, right? Um, so, I mean, you know, a, a lot of it has sort of do with kind of philosophical techniques, rhetorical techniques of writing, but, but it's a very different structure um, of justification. Uh, do we have accountability in this country? So what I was presenting was in a sense, you know, stylized idle type, right? I mean, it was basically saying the old structure was premised on a certain set of principles. And I think the tragedy is that it broke down even internal to those principles. Right? And it broke down for a very contingent set of reasons. I mean, I, I think the point you made about the Prime Minister is, is absolutely central because there is no getting around the fact that part of the current governability crisis stems from the fact that the entire system of government has been warped because the Prime Minister doesn't have authority. Right? So, in a sense, what is the dynamic in government right now? It's not that the Prime Minister says, I didn't know. It's even when the prime minister knows, he says, my job is to write a letter, not to take an action. So he distances himself from that action. What does the cabinet do? Right? Old-fashioned cabinets would go out and explain to the public, this is a collective decision, this is 10 reasons why we took it. 
I mean, to me, the most amazing thing about the 2G thing was not the sort of the scam, was the fact that nowhere did government ever explain clearly. And if it had done that, half its problems would be, right? The distortion in governance, and, and this, I think, from a democratic point of view is, is, is important. Once we took the decision to say bureaucrats will go to parliamentary standing committees, not ministers, the entire system became warped. Because ministers, in the old-fashioned system, in the vertical system, it had one virtue. Bureaucrat's job is to act as professional advice giver. Minister's job is to overrule him. He's the democratically elected, so long as he records the reasons why he's doing it. Now you're in this vicious cycle because politicians have lost presumptive authority. They don't want to be seen to be overruling some a technocrat because that is itself, even if they haven't done anything wrong, so, you know, there must be something wrong, right? So you want to fire the gun from the shoulder of the bureaucrat, who then has to go and explain to the parliamentary standing committee, as opposed to what used to happen, which is a minister has to go and explain. It's your call, right? So at one level, I mean, there's this kind of simultaneous process going on where that internal system of vertical control, even in its own premises, I actually think it was a very limited conception of accountability and won't, you know, it would have broken down at some level. But even in the integrity of its own internal functioning, right, has broken down. And one of the things that has done is that it has made it very hard for government to, in a sense, respond to these new trends in a coherent way, right? I mean, in a sense, I think we are at that moment like the US was in the 1920s and 1930s, right? Where ultimately the response to corruption, right, to policy paralysis, to all of that, was a progressive movement, right? But, but it was a genuinely political movement, right? right? But because the political class, in a sense, I think is, is, is caught in that moment of extraordinary defensiveness across the board, Right? Nobody is standing up and asking this question other than bits and pieces. You know, we are at the cusp of this momentous change. How do we now harness it? Instead of, in a sense, kind of resisting it, um, uh, 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 resisting it with the old system. I know I've not fully answered the questions, but you know, maybe we'll do it sort of after this. And I totally agree with you that the debate surrounding the LARR bill right now is, you know, a good faith conflict. Um, I've been following your columns and your previous writings on it also. Just wanted to prick your brain a little bit more. Uh, there are very few doubting Thomases on this today, and you are one of those who have expressed your views publicly. But uh, do you, would you agree if I say that one of the biggest dangers or the problems that could lie ahead is the fact that we would have just one single national, you know, framework for the whole country on land acquisition. You know, how would, wouldn't that be the wickedest problem? We've been like clamoring for it for decades, but how do you see that playing out, you know? I, I, I actually agree with that in the sense that if I were to make one empirical prediction about the recommendations of the Standing Committee, one empirical prediction is that it's going to work fine for states that are economically growing fast. It's going to be a complete disaster for states that are actually left behind, right? Uh, you know, because in a sense, the economics of that transaction is very different. In Haryana, farmers want to get their land listed for acquisition. They're dying to get it list listed for acquisition. I mean, there's a negotiation of prices holding out, right? Because the economics is, well, actually both things are different. It's not just that the economics is different. But in their mind, they've actually seen a pathway out of their current predicament. The problem with Odisha and West Bengal, right, and why land acquisition was paradoxically more difficult there than it was, in, let's say, in Maharashtra and was there, is not only is because the economics is different. It's one thing when you're saying, you know, 80 lakhs an acre, it's another thing when you're saying, okay, even with triple market price, six lakhs an acre. I mean, it's a very different. But the second thing which is very different 
is your confidence to be able to negotiate what that new system is depends on a lot of other things, right? So in that sense, I think, I think my worry about all of these, you know, the very simple formulas about pricing, three times market price, no land acquisition on the peripheries of cities. I mean, what that means is basically you're saying we don't want agglomeration, right? Uh, I think that's where the debate, in a sense, should take place. Uh, and now the ideal solution to this, because as you say, I, I, you know, I'm prepared to be persuaded either way, would be the push to what in the theoretical literature is called directly deliberative polyarchy, right? Because there the idea is that you move away from over-reliance on simple representative institutions to institutions and mechanisms that can do this social learning for you and respond as we learn more, right? Uh, and I think that was part of the rationale for regulatory agencies, for example. I mean, it's not, I don't think regulatory agencies have the rationale in this neoliberal thing of, you know, uh, uh, taking functions away from the state and courts. I think it was really the idea to create a very different kind of forum whose authority depends on being able to hear all stakeholders and give reasons and justifications for it. The problem is that we don't have practices of institution building that can create institutions of that kind at some point. At, right? at some point, one easy answer, cop-out answer would be, let's have a land acquisition board with you know, a certain set of guidelines. Let it figure this one out. The problem is, I think all of our first reaction is we don't trust these guys, right? So I think that's, that's the hump we have to, in a sense, cross over where the demands are for a different kind of institutional architecture. But at the moment, the trust in the system is so low that, you know, you say, look, any new architecture will probably be even worse than the existing one. So the investment in the status quo continues. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what you're... Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, number one, I want to refer to the Land Acquisition Act. Recently, I saw a document of the government of Karnataka. They are going to meet on 7th and 8th of June for the uh, uh, global summit, etc., etc., oh, in that context. Yeah. This document says, if a farmer refuses to part his land government will use 1894 law, 1894 law, and by force take over the land. Mm. That's one point. Second, there will be 100% tax exemption to the new investors coming to Karnataka, et cetera, et cetera. So these two points I want to refer to. Mm. So my question is, why should we carry on that 1894 law to deal with 2012 farmers problem with us it's a basic colonial attitude we are keeping therefore when i hear the government of india says if 200000 farmers committed suicide in the last 10 years mm. if agriculturists cannot survive there they are welcome to come to the cities of india is our government a lunatic asylum it is my question Number one. Maybe for a, for a different reason. Yeah, number one. You can explain. Number two. You mentioned a very important point in the end. We need a governance revolution. Excellent. But I see a kind of a trick in that process that is happening. Recently, I attended a seminar of 25 sets of women who were elected in Karnataka. This is referred to Karnataka only. 26, 25 sets of women presidents and secretaries elected by the people into Panchayat Raj. They explained their problems, horrifying, shocking problems. They said very clearly, only two women were exceptions. The rest of them said that the male members elected, MLAs and MPs of the region, they don't allow the women to function. They make secretaries and presidents fight each other so that they cannot come together to sign checks for the public purposes. All these are happening underground. Government will not bring them out to the open. Some of us have to do the 
the spying were to get it done. What does that indicate, basically, to the future of India governance revolution? My feeling is, can we take up this law, Panchayat Raj, which is the basic right of people across India, Panchayat, and make women responsible more instead of these lunatic people sitting in Delhi? Thank you for your lecture, sir. I have a quick comment and a question. You seem to suggest that the courts and the Supreme Court in particular are happy not to upset the ap apple cart out of a sense of self-preservation. But the basic structure judgments of the Supreme Court actually prove the converse. When the government wanted to oust judicial review, the Supreme Court, of course, by a thin majority, struck down that proposed amendment. And that doctrine has come to stay. If anything, that line of judgment risked the very existence of the Supreme Court. And ironically, the criticism now is that the, the Supreme Court and the courts in India are, are too active and too powerful as opposed to being status quoist. My question, of course, is that you seem to equate uh, the rule of law largely with justice de delivery by the courts, except for some of your concluding comments. Was there any particular reason for that? Okay, I'll maybe begin with the second question first and then come to your larger question. Um, I, I think a couple of things, clarifications, right? So, and maybe I think this is a difference in orientation with, I guess, my legal friends in the room, right? Uh, I have no doubt that the doctrine of the Supreme Court is expansive. And in a sense, I think it's the logic of judiciaries across the world that they will have an expansive doctrine. So. They will say, nothing escapes the empire of judicial review. Okay, that's an expansive doctrine, right? In that sense, basic structure was a, was a moment in the evolution of that doctrine, right? The actual practice and application, right, of what, which is, I cannot think of a single instance of any kind whether on legislation or whether actually, by the way, on the prosecution of politicians, Raja case notwithstanding, right? Where the Supreme Court has actually put the, executive, the, the structure, the basic structure of executive power at any kind of risk. In economic matters, it is by and large actually deferred. I mean, you know, if you, if, you, if you actually look at the, in fact, part of the problem happened partly because it differed, right? I mean, this whole sort of developmental public, the 1894 Act, I mean, just think of a counterfactual history. Just think if the counterfactual history had been a very well articulated conception in the court of what public purpose means and relatively decent enforcement uh, so, um, compensation mechanisms. I think the nature of debate in India over the 1894 Act would have been very different, right? Now, I think there's a general problem, which I think increases as legislation pertains on to policy matters more, which is the enforcement problem, which is law never creates its own order, right? I think there's way too much focus on doctrine, not on the functionality of actually what that, what actually in a sense happens. So in doctrine, Oh, spectacular, oh, wonderful. And, and you might say that that doctrine is a necessary element in the expansion of those powers and the act of that justification, right? But the practice is actually much, much more carefully judged, much, much more. And as I said, I'm not actually, uh, I'm ambivalent about it. I mean, I'm ambivalent about it in the sense that as an account of the court's ability to manage conflict, I think these compromises may not have been a bad thing, right? As a matter of law, understood in my classic legal understanding of what rule of law means, it's all over the place, right? Uh, and I think the question is whether we, why don't we just get explicit about it and talk it? Because I think, I think one of the things that happens in law schools, I think, and not just law schools, but I think even in the way my discipline, political theory, talks about the law and so on, is there is a canonical authority idea of what legal reasoning is. There is a canonical idea of what correctness in that reasoning is. I don't think that canonical idea can make sense of what's going on in courts. 
right? And maybe we are just better off talking about it explicitly rather than sort of fudging it in, 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 in the dark. I agree with you. I mean, I didn't make the various distinctions about, you know, justice delivery systems, um, the court as a kind of constitutional court in, in, in you know, in, 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 you know in, 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 in some respects. Um, and, and partly the justice delivery system is going to put aside because there, at some level, not entirely, you can think of a few technical solutions that might actually, in a sense, help, uh, uh, help, the, help the process. Uh, your last, your questions, and I'll just sort of end briefly. One large, which is, uh, I'm a big votary of decentralization uh, and Panchayati Raj, provided, provided, you are prepared for one thing, which is you are prepared for an incredibly messy transition process. If you are going to devolve power to panchayats, guaranteed for the next 10 years, corruption in panchayats will go up, right? I mean, even in Rajasthan panchayats, there's some evidence that people are now spending 35, 40 lakhs con contesting panchayat elections, right? Because the volume of money flowing through the panchayats is is a crore or more now, so right, the stakes a bit. So in that process, you are actually going to go through this period of immense messiness. And, and my argument is that I think you have to think of it as a process. Right? Now, the odd thing that the Panchayati Raj devolution thing, and this is the trade-off, the wicked problem trade-off. I think empirically there is a case to be made that representation of women in Panchayat is a good thing. Right? Consequentially speaking, although there's some normative issues about whether you want to think of representation in those terms. But it had one perverse consequence, which is the rotation. Now, rotation is the antithesis of the principle of accountability. If I know I don't have to go to the voter next time, right, my actually corruption calculus becomes very different. Right? So in fact, rotation, I would submit, I mean, I think this needs more study, but I think actually rotation undermined the local accountability principle. What was the local accountability principle? That you'll have local knowledge, you'll have repeat interactions, you'll be able to identify the distinguishing characteristics of a good performer and a bad performer. But what has rotation done? Rotation has actually taken away that accountability tool, right? So one of the things that that actually points to in our institutional design stories is my own sense is that institutional design architectures are too overloaded with immediate normative objectives. So it should represent social justice. Issue. It's not enough, does not enough think through the dynamics of accountability. I'll just end with one other example, which is I think relevant to the Panchayati Raj. Um, representation of Dalits, scheduled castes, right? So we went for the system of reserved constituencies. Now, the paradox of reserved constituencies was that for the longest time, it was the most effective way of disempowering Dalits. Why? Do you have more power, if you are a social group, Dalits, in a constituency where you are the marginal deciding vote between two different groups, or where you have an assured desert Dalit representative, but the other group is going to decide which of the two Dalit representatives is going to get elected, right? It was an absolutely brilliant scheme to disempower Dalits. That is why it was not until you actually got a social movement like the BSP. And by the way, Dalit MPs who get, get elected in non-reserve constituencies are far more politically powerful than MPs who get elected in reserve constituencies, right? So, I think in our institutional design, I mean, one of the things that worry is that it's too overloaded with sort of normative expressive concerns and much less sensitive to, in a sense, the dynamic games that it is actually going to set in place. institution design problem uh, or the focus for institution design one of the one of the ways to build institu institutions that can tackle wicked problems is to make institutions that are fungible which can which can find its way and you articulated about that as well uh, 
but if you want to look look forward and see how the judiciary can change its course over the next few years and and what do you see that process being if you could go in a in a in a very right. simplistic design right. and say you know one two three things that we could look at right i mean if you look at politically we are saying the right to lie the right to food right to education you know these are things that that are coming from the political viewpoint right and do you see what what could happen in the in the legal legal dimension so at the risk of being even more reckless than i have been <laughs> up till now i would actually venture to guess that of all the branches of government we will actually have much more discussion about the crisis in the indian judiciary 7 to 10 years from now than we will have about the crisis of indian democracy uh for a set of reasons right which is one it is going to be hard to change the judiciary from outside for good and for bad reasons i mean i think the good reason is a self protective one look you know for good or for ill we know this beast uh, you know now you put a national judicial accountability commission who knows what's going to happen right i mean we don't trust ourselves enough to be able to do it right so that gives the judiciary a sort of a free pass in some respects and it has got a free pass there's absolutely no doubt about it right second i think with the judiciary so the other mechanism of change which is a kind of internal one right which is uh indian politics also has very entrenched power structures but you know there is an ebb and flow i mean you don't know what coalitions are going to come to power strange judiciary that's not going to happen for quite a long time right and and if you in a sense look at the current entrance of the system uh both by way of their training by way of their dispositions their entry upwards uh it it would be a miracle if they in a sense even half understood these i mean i mean there'll be hit and miss there'll be a few brilliant judges like we still have and so forth but i think the system as a whole will in a sense find it find it hard uh the litigation story is going to get much more complicated probably both in numbers i mean if nick robinson's papers is right and you know people get more educated you're going to get more litigation. so you have the sheer management story uh but you have the sheer in a sense complexity of managing what that litigation the kinds of litigation is story uh now one or two changes may happen i mean so one interesting institution to watch i think i i think the jury is out on this one is for example the national green tribunal right here is an institution designed to compensate for the weakness of environmental adjud adjudication in the court system right uh it's too early to say how it's going to evolve but it provided a mechanism for an immense new lateral entry into the system right i mean it's incredible right equal number of non judicial members right of equal standing as judicial members there is some evidence that that's already beginning to change the kinds of questions that we are actually beginning to ask and interestingly not in ways people had predicted i mean not as in you know ngt is green and there's industry out there that's pulling right it's on precisely good sound technical questions right so if you do a, a radiation impact assessment have you done a cumulative one right the posco order to me was interesting because it actually for the first time asked all the right questions it didn't get into this you know sustainable development means you are out it basically said if you have done an ei on 4 million tons and the plant is saying 12 million tons please come and explain what this is about right so you have pockets where that is beginning to happen in you know in in tiny but i i actually i actually do think you will have i mean i think we will need another upendra bakshi to write the crisis of the indian judiciary 7 years from now i'm more optimistic about indian democracy that note thank you prasad